Okay, so um, I think um, I'm not, Oscar, I'm not going to introduce you because uh, we've just met. Um, I think I will leave you to introduce yourself if you don't mind. Um, yep. All I'll say that Oscar's uh, story is pretty amazing and he has done some incredible things uh, in New Zealand and I will hand over to you and you can start as you as you see fit. Cool. Thank you very much, Derek, for having me. So I'm just going to run through uh, the birds of New Zealand, basically, because I know it's a difficult time for everyone being stuck at home and, uh, well, Lots of people are stuck in their home countries and many of you are stuck inside your houses as well. So I thought I'd bring some of uh, our birds in Aotearoa, New Zealand to you uh, as we are still able to go out and see them as we can. Um, and we'll start with the Southern Royal Albatross, which is the largest flying bird in the world, which you can see here, which I photographed quite recently, a couple of weeks ago uh, on the Auckland Islands, which is about 400 kilometers south of New Zealand. And I'll show that on a map soon. And yeah, I'll give you an introduction to the birds of our country and run through most of the main ones and show you many of my photographs that I've taken um, since I was nine years old. So I'll just talk a little bit about myself to begin with. There we go. Hopefully that's working fine. Cool. So I'm 20 years old. And I'm originally from Auckland, which is New Zealand's largest city with 1.5 million people. I moved recently to Dunedin to begin studying uh, and I'm at the University of Otago uh, studying a Bachelor of Science in Ecology and Zoology. And as I said, I was first interested in birds when I was nine years old on a school trip to Tiritiri Matangi Island, which is a sanctuary um, up in Auckland. And it's a very unique place. So New Zealand has this problem where when humans came here, it was the last sort of major landmass to be settled by humans. And when they came, they brought with them rabbits, cats, rats, stoats, mice, weasels, ferrets, possums, and all those. And they really impacted our native wildlife as New Zealand didn't have any native land mammals apart from two species of bat, which are about this big. And of course there are seals, um, whales, and dolphins around the coast. So when they brought with them all these um, invasive species, a lot of our birds could not deal with um, that change. So uh, places like Tiri Tiri Matangi are some of the only places in New Zealand where you can actually see what the birds were like before humans sort of arrived, because they've removed the predators from the island and translocated some of our endemic species that haven't been doing too well back to the islands where they've been able to flourish. So I went there when I was nine years old and I've been back almost every year since um, and became a guide there when I was 15. Um, so some of you might've heard of it because it's um, very popular with tourists uh, normally when they come from overseas. And yeah, I would go there and guide tourists around and share with them some of our special birds and some of my um, enthusiasm for them. So in New Zealand, I have seen 224 species of bird in my life, uh, which is pretty good. Not many people have seen more than 200. That's sort of the target for birders in New Zealand. And that is out of a total of about 390 species that have ever been recorded in New Zealand. Uh, that does include uh, lots of vagrants, of course, uh, which might have only visited once or twice. And I have seen 540 species around the world, mostly in Australia and Europe. Uh, I spent a year in Belgium when I was 19 on a youth exchange and managed to get back uh, right before COVID hit. So that was quite lucky. And while I was over there, I had the opportunity to create this, which is very special. Um, so the little book you see in the corner is by a friend of mine, Liz Light, who um, passed away last year. And she created this, uh, the 50 best bird watching sites in New Zealand guide and asked me for some of my photographs to contribute to that. And once it was completed, she gave my name to the um, publishing company, which is based in London, John Beaufoy Publishing. And they wanted to create a naturalist guide to the birds of New Zealand, um, just showing more generally uh, a lot of our native species. And she put my name forward and I had the opportunity to create that while I was on my exchange, which is quite lucky because 
uh, if I was studying at the time, it would have been quite difficult to balance out. Um, yeah, I always had been interested in the idea of putting together a book of New Zealand birds, uh, but using my own photographs, I was really lucky to be in the position where it was um, feasible to do so. So I was a few months onto my youth exchange in 2019 when I had the offer. And with a bit of effort, I got down 40,000 words and 400 photographs together. And after 10 months, managed to put this thing all together. And I finished it off two weeks into university. So it was a little um, bit of a rush at the end there, but that's how it goes with projects like that. And it released in October last year, and I'm very happy with it. And a good chunk of it was actually written while riding on trains um, across Belgium, which is a surprisingly pe peaceful pastime. And it was enjoyable comparing contrasting different sources of literature um, alongside my own observations to compile it. And I hope it appeals to anyone looking um, where to begin on exploring our wonderful bird life, uh, tourists when they're eventually able to come back into the country. And um, of course, New Zealanders as well, that want to learn more about our birds. So my talk today, will have a fair few photos from the book and many I've taken since then as well. That's what it looks like on the inside. And uh, that bird on the left there, uh, the North Island Korkako, that is my favorite bird, which sort of started off my passion. Uh, they have a really amazing call. Um, I recommend looking it up actually, because I haven't put any sound files in here because they often don't work. Um, but yeah, they, they sound almost like an organ or a flute in the forest and their call can carry for over two kilometers. They move around the treetops at dawn and dusk and sort of announce that their territory um, is where it is to the neighboring birds. And it's really quite special. So here's a map of New Zealand uh, down in the bottom right. You can see uh, how it looks. And then close up of the North and South Islands, very creative names, I know. Um, so in the top left there, you can see Auckland, which is where I uh, grew up. And in the bottom right, if you look at the bottom of the South Island, you can see Dunedin, uh, which is where I am coming to you now. So New Zealand is home to some of the most unique uh, birds on the planet. And it's not just my opinion. It has been isolated from the rest of the world for about 80 million years. So the nearest landmass is Australia. And that's about 2,000 2, kilometers away across the Tasman Sea. So this isolation combined with an array of islands spanning the latitudes from the subtropical north to the subantarctic south has been the perfect recipe for really high rates of endemism. So before human arri arrival in about 1300 AD, about 70% of our breeding birds were endemic. It consists of many islands as well. So it's estimated to be about 600. And um, you can see a few of the major ones there. So there's the Kermitic Islands to the north, which is actually closer to Tonga than it is New Zealand. Uh, the Chatham Islands, Bounty Islands, and Antipodes, Campbell, Auckland, and Snares. So these make up the New Zealand subantarctic. So during the Cretaceous period, uh, the supercontinent Gondwana split. And the part of New Zealand that sort of broke off from that was known as Zealandia. And it's represented here by the orange color, um, which is also merged, of course, apart from the, the North and South Islands and the Little Islands. And that drifted away from Australia and Antarctica and allowed the fauna and flora to sort of evolve in isolation from the rest of the world. So here's a few of the scenes um, of my photos around New Zealand. Um, this was taken on the Auckland Islands where I had the privilege to visit uh, just over two weeks ago. And if anyone does come to New Zealand and <laughs> has the opportunity to visit any of these offshore islands, I highly recommend it. Um, they're just other worlds really. Most of them are untouched by humans um, to a good extent. Islands such as the Snares Islands, actually this one here, um, never had any mammals on them. So you can, if you can see closely, um, all these little black dots around in the sky are sooty shearwaters. So these really small islands here, they're about 300 hectares, 
and they say that more seabirds breed there than the entirety of the British Isles. So I think it's approximately 3 million pairs of sooty shearwaters and about 300 hectares of land. This is um, an island just off Auckland called Great Barrier Island. And you can see some of the range of habitats here um, that is typical of most of New Zealand, actually. Um, sandy beaches and open ocean just in the background. Uh, forested mountains, which is what most of New Zealand would have been like previously uh, before humans did lots of clearance. Um, I believe 94% of our wetlands have been lost since humans arrived and colonized New Zealand. Um, a lot of them were drained to sort of make way for dairy farms and um, settlements and things like that, which is quite unfortunate. Um, and of course forests, uh, which is the majority of um, New Zealand's uh, land cover. And a good chunk of those have also disappeared in the last few hundred years. So these are the Chatham Islands here, which is out to the east of New Zealand as well. So to talk a bit about where our birds might have come from, um, I'm going to start way back. And studies um, have found that Polynesians uh, discovered New Zealand around 1300 AD, um, after a succession of voyages from the Southern Pacific Islands. And at this point, it was really like the land of the birds. So Maori, Maori expansion, which is the, the natives, Maori, um, led to the clearing of nearly 50% of native forest cover uh, by fire across most uh, the main islands. And certain birds proved to be an easy source of food. So most of you all know the, the moa, which um, was hunted to extinction shortly after the arrival of the Maori in New Zealand. So we had nine species and they're gigantic flightless birds, which you can see here in the center. And they were quickly hunted to extinction unfortunately, uh, about 600 years ago. So the largest, uh, the South Island giant moa, could, uh, would stand two meters or six foot six um, when it was sort of idle, I suppose. And it could reach foliage, foliage up to 3.6 meters tall, uh, which was 11 foot 10 off the ground. And that would make them the tallest bird species known when they were stretching up like that. And alongside the moa disappeared the harsh eagle, which you can see they're attacking the moa in the depiction. And that was also the largest eagle to ever exist. And it completely relied on moa to hunt and feed on. Um, so shortly after the moa went extinct, the harsh eagle also did, which is really unfortunate. There were stories that they would um, apparently take young children, but it's so long ago, it's hard to sort of verify things like that. I think, some claw marks were found on some old um, human remains, which was quite interesting. And much earlier than the moa and the Haas eagle were the prehistoric giant penguins. Uh, they get a notable mention as New Zealand was recently found to be uh, the origin place of penguins completely, um, not Antarctica, which most people might assume. And the size of the species just shows that many of the earliest penguins were giants much larger than the emperor penguin, which is the largest living penguin. So this one here, Bice's penguin, stand up to 1.7 meters, and it lived approximately 50 million years ago. So some species just died out um, with natural causes as well. So looking at a few of our iconic species, um, on the left here, we have the rifleman and the rock wren, which are the two living species in the order known as the New Zealand wrens. And they are thought to be some of the most ancient passerines. Um, they were the first ones to sort of evolve and they've remained um, quite sort of how they, how they are over the last wee while. And of course the kiwi, which is the iconic bird of New Zealand, uh, flightless, nocturnal, and it has the shortest bill in the world, would you believe? Because bill length is actually measured from the nostrils to the tip of the bill. And their nostrils being at the tip of the bill, um, not shown there very well, but 
just makes it so that their bills are actually only a few millimeters long, which uh, a lot of people find quite entertaining. We have five species, um, all flightless and nocturnal, and they're endangered. A story about the wrens here. So the rifleman, the rock wren, the, the two uh, last living species in their order, but we also had seven others. Um, one of those being uh, Steph Stevens Island wren. And the story goes that they lived on an island and a lighthouse keeper moved to the island with his cat. And the cat brought wrens into the lighthouse keeper. Um, and eventually when people went to look for the wrens, they couldn't find any more because there were no more. Which is, it just shows the destruction like cats can cause, especially in New Zealand when most of the birds are not used to dealing with predators like that. And yeah, the Stevens Island wren had the problem of being flightless as well. So it really had nothing going for it um, when cats came for the came to the island. And we don't think it was just the one cat, um, despite how people might tell the story. Um, there were already lots of feral cats on the island um, once humans moved there, which is quite unfortunate. So that's a bit of forest habitat um, that's pretty typical of um, New Zealand. And when Captain James Cook came here in the 1770s, he noted that birdsong was deafening. And the first European settlers began to destroy British habitat such as this. Uh, only 23% of the original forest cover remains across um, mainland New Zealand. And I thought this is an interesting map to include. Um, these are the distributions of the five kiwi species that we have. So, well, actually, the maps on the left show where they were thought to exist before humans arrived in New Zealand. And then the map on the right is where they are found now. So you can see especially species like the Rowi in green and the little spotted kiwi in blue, which is only on offshore islands now. Um, a lot of these species have had a massive range restriction over the last, well, this represents 700 years, but definitely over the last um, 200 years specifically. Um, yeah. So that's quite a dramatic uh, decline. Um, but despite this, kiwis are very intensively managed by our local Department of Conservation. So they have actually been increasing in recent years, which is really good. The North Island brown kiwi, which uh, is in red, I believe, the sort of diamond shaped, is the most common. And there's about 25,000 of those left. And the rarest one being the rowing in green, there's only about 300 birds. So as I said, most of the photos in this presentation are my own, but Kiwi are notoriously difficult to photograph being nocturnal. So I have a few of my friends photographs here um, to just give you a good idea of what they look like. So when the Europeans arrived, um, sort of in the early 1800s, these are some of the things that they brought with them. So the rat, possum, cat, stoat and weasel. And it's hard to say really what was going through their minds when they bought some of them. It's really ridiculous. Um, things like rats, of course, came accidentally just on ships and such like that. Uh, but rabbits were introduced and possums uh, from Australia for the fur trade. And they just sort of exploded out of control because they had no natural predators. So they thought, why don't we introduce stoats to sort of deal with that? And the stoats just basically massacred kiwi because they were much easier targets and possibly tastier to them too. So within a century, these invasive predators um, became found over the entirety of New Zealand. And we are lucky that there are a few islands where they never made it, um, where some of our very rare birds hang on. But I believe about 50 species um, went extinct since the Māori first arrived in New Zealand uh, 700 years ago. So, yeah, not, not all of them were so lucky. Another really special bird that we would have had, this is another prehistoric one, um, that I thought it was worth mentioning because it was only recently discovered, despite the bone um, sitting on a shelf for nearly 14 years, uh, was the giant parrot. So you can see there in the bottom left how big this, this bird would have been. 
um, Pericles and Expectatus. And this actually would have been the origin for three species that we do have, Kia, Kaka and Kakapo, which are very iconic um, parrot species in New Zealand. So the Kakapo on the right there is unique in being the world's heaviest living parrot species and the only one that is flightless and well as nocturnal and exceedingly long lived. So they think they can live for over a hundred years. They're uh, extremely endangered. Um, of course, since they're flightless, they were eradicated from the mainland by cats and mustelids and all that. And a small population were found, was found on Stewart Islands, just off the south um, coast of New Zealand. Um, and now today there is 206. So they're very carefully monitored and they all have names. So this one is Soroka. The response to a potential predator is to freeze and they rely on their camouflage to hide them sort of amongst the forest uh, floor. They do climb up into the canopy as well. And while this would be effective on vision based predators like um, eagles and harriers and falcons, which um, dominated New Zealand skies before humans got here, it does nothing to prevent an attack by a cat or stoat or dog or other mammalian predators which uh, use their sense of smell to find their prey. Uh, male kakapo have a very sweet smell. A lot of people would describe it as an old clarinet case. So they really had no chance there. And another thing that many of our endemic birds evolved to do in the absence of predators was become flightless uh, or become really poor flyers. So kakapo, as I said, was flightless, um, and active during the night and cryptic in appearance. Uh, which were, would have been favorable to their survival um, prior to human arrival, but now is detrimental to them. So these three birds that you see photos of here um, are all extinct, unfortunately. So the laughing owl, this was the one of three photographs taken of it, um, went extinct in 1921, I believe. And the bush wren and the South Island snipe um, were two or three species to be translocated um, from this really small island during a rat invasion. So they swam to this little island and they, the early conservationists tried to save these two species along with the South Island saddleback, which um, luckily survived. Um, but the snipe and the bush wren uh, did not survive the translocations and ultimately went extinct in 1970. So the environment is sort of at the heart of New Zealand's identity and it shapes our economy, lifestyles, culture. And although it's not really relevant at the moment, um, tourism was our sort of largest contributor to export earnings and more and more visitors that come here um, choose uh, nature as a major reason um, for visiting. But with a decline in biodiversity like this, um, it's just, it's not really sustainable. It's one third of New Zealand's birds have gone extinct since human arrival um, because of uh, the introduced mammals which kill approximately 25 million native birds every year. And even the best efforts of um, conservation pioneers could not save the bush wren or the snipe. Um, and it just sort of culminates into that, but a lot more effort has been put into conservation in recent years, so hopefully no more of our birds will go extinct. But enough talk of extinction, I want to talk a bit about some of our amazing birds. Um, the huia there in the bottom right, it's also extinct, um, so that's why it's an artwork. I do have to talk a bit about that one because that's also quite special. So you see the tail feathers there, um, really long black feathers with white tips. So that was, um, they were put sort of in in the crowns of Māori chiefs, which was a sign of sort of leadership and royalty. And it sort of became a trend. So when English people came over to New Zealand in the 1800s and early 1900s, um, they liked the look of those feathers. So they just went and shot the last remaining who he is and, and used their feathers as fashion statement. And it just, 
it's really hard to comprehend. So the huia was one of three wattle birds alongside the kokako on the left, which is the, my favorite one, and the saddleback at the top. Uh, they're called wattle birds for the, the little fleshy wattles that they have right at the base of the bill. And they're also very poor flyers. And the kokako and the saddleback are quite endangered, but uh, they can be found uh, in forests across um, offshore islands where there's no predators and select areas on the mainland with very intensive predator control or exclusion areas. So we have um, pest proof fenced off sanctuaries which can stop rats and cats and stuff from getting in and affecting the birds. And a lot of our birds can be found there. Um, the best example being Zealandia in Wellington City, which is the capital, uh, has been pest proofed and over the last 10 years or so, um, birds have just been sort of breeding up in there and sort of spilling over the fence, which is a really cool effect of places like that. Um, the kaka, the big um, brown parrot, which is just back here on the left, um, they have made an incredible comeback in Wellington. If you ever get to our capital city, you'll almost certainly see them just sort of flying around and it's quite a foresty town. So that's really amazing. They had a thousand chicks hatched there over the last um, 10 years. So here's a few of our raptors. So we've got two breeding species, which is the New Zealand falcon on the left uh, and top middle and the swamp harrier on the right. And the swamp harrier is abundant. So they're found sort of everywhere, especially in um, wetland and rural areas. You know, they feed on roadkill and um, small animals and things like that. And they're also found in Australia. And the New Zealand falcon is endemic and fairly rare. There's probably about five to 10,000 birds left and they're quite versatile. They can be found um, in forest habitats or rural open country or even the subantarctic islands. And they do come into um, urban areas every now and then as well. And we do have vagrants um, that come over every now and then from Australia. So we had a black kite um, fairly recently. We had one that stayed for 20 years and a few others as well. Cool. So here are some of our owls as well. So the moorpork is the main one on the left and that is fairly common across New Zealand. It's quite small, it's only about 25 centimetres um, or like that big for people who don't use centimetres. And the little owl is introduced from Germany and that's even smaller. And the barn owl is a fairly recent arrival. They only started breeding in New Zealand 14 years ago, uh, way in the far north and have started spreading out from there. But because they're nocturnal, they've been pretty undetected so far. So they could be a lot more than we realize. Barn owls, of course, are one of the most sort of cosmop cosmopolitan bird species found in almost every country. Um, on every continent except Antarctica. So they're, they're really good at sort of dispersing and establishing in new areas. This is a mountain scene typical of the South Island. Um, in the middle there is Auraki Mount Cook, which is actually the tallest peak in New Zealand. Uh, I think it's about 4,000 metres tall. And we have a few species of bird that um, live above the tree line and some of them are very specially adapted to that. So the, the blue duck on the right is a good example. They live in fast flowing mountain rivers and have huge webbed feet, which are ready as soon as they hatch out of the egg. And that can keep them sort of going from going downstream. And they dabble in there and find little insect larvae. And of course, they're quite endangered as well. And the takahe on the left was actually thought to be extinct um, in 19, sorry, 1898, and then rediscovered in a single mountain valley 50 years later. Uh, they, they found a population of several hundred birds, which was quite remarkable. 
and today they've they've increased slightly um, to about 400. In the bottom left, the rock wren I mentioned before, um, they are sort of our only true alpine bird, which lives amongst the rocks uh, and scree slopes um, up on high mountains. And they bizarrely don't get observed during the winter. I don't know anyone that's seen one during the winter ever, um, only during summer. So we don't actually know yet what they do, um, whether they might hibernate or something along those lines or feed under the snow or go down to the tree line. Um, but yeah, that's a bit of a mystery. And the kia in the bottom center there, which is also known as the alpine parrot. And a few smaller parrot species, um, the kakariki, which are quite popular pets overseas. Um, yeah, the red crowned parakeet, of course you can't export birds from New Zealand in the wild anymore, um, but back when it was legal, the red crowned parakeet um, would be taken overseas where they're still bred in captivity and sold as pets, which is quite bizarre to see in a pet shop on the other side of the world when they're an endangered native species here in your own country. And special mention to the Antipodes Island parakeet, which is on one of the subantarctic islands, which I pointed out on the other map. Um, and these guys are really weird. Um, they sort of hop around on the rocks and tussock, and they feed on carrion and small sort of um, birds sometimes if they come across them. And yeah, they're quite, quite vicious. Uh, we have two species of cuckoos uh, that are resident, well resident, they're some of our only migratory birds apart from seabirds and shorebirds. So I know in of course Europe and North America and Africa migration is a huge thing. Um, most of your birds leave during the winter or come during the summer or something along those lines. In New Zealand almost all our birds are sedentary. Um, because we don't have really dramatic um, changes in temperature like other places do. So the average temperature in the summer might be 25 degrees uh, Celsius. And then in the winter, it might go down to maybe 10 degrees. Um, of course, warmer in the north, colder in the south generally. But yeah, so most of our birds stay here. But these cuckoos, they migrate here during our summer, which is um, sort of the October to March period and they lay their eggs in the nests of some of their other native species, which I'll point out on the next slide. And then they go off to the Pacific Islands uh, for New Zealand winter as well. So the long-tailed cuckoo, which is the one on the right, lays its eggs in the nests of the whitehead and yellowhead, which are the birds in the sort of top right centre. And the Shining cookie lays its eggs generally in the grey warbler in the top left, um, in the grey warbler's nest, which is quite small, um, sort of the shape and size of a little apple. Um, and they have a little entrance on the front of the nest. So it's hard to say how they really get the egg in there, whether they um, sort of sit at the entrance and lay it through the entrance or anything like that. So these are some of our smaller sort of resident forest birds. Um, most of these are pretty easy to come across, um, apart from the stitch bird um, and the yellowhead, which are quite endangered. The stitch bird used to be found all over the North Island and then became restricted to one offshore island and are slowly being reintroduced back to sort of predator controlled populations. Um, yeah. And the New Zealand fantail on the left is another one of our iconic species. So that comes in a pied form and a black form, which is more common the further south you go. And I guess that would be because um, there's a word for it, but the further south you go, the darker the color of the sort of birds, um, because it would be better at conserving heat.
and the Tui on the right, along with the Bellbird, are uh, uh, New Zealand's representative of the Honey Eaters, which in Australia is like a hundred species or something ridiculous like that. Um, we've got the two and they drink the nectar from flowers and they're very sort of boisterous and aggressive and quite common across most of the country, possibly because they're so aggressive. It's allowed them to, to sort of defend themselves from predators a bit more than most. <coughs> we also have these um, representative of the Australasian robins. Uh, the North and South Island robin um, speak for themselves really. Uh, they're very friendly, a lot more like, well, I guess the European robins aren't super um, trusting, but uh, our ones are. And if you sit very still, they can sit on your boots and have a look at you. And as you walk around the forest, as you're disturbing the insects, they might follow you and grab some of those. The black robin in the top right deserves a special mention. So at one point in time, this was the rarest bird in the world. And we, while there might be other things that were like undetected or like that, you can't really dispute it because all the ones alive today come from a single breeding pair. So it doesn't get much closer to its detection than that. So back in 1980, there was a small island off a small island off a small island off the Chatham Islands, which is already 800 kilometers to the east of New Zealand, that held a very small population of these birds, five total, um, but three of these were not producing any offspring. Um, and then the single pair had a remarkable sort of comeback story and with very intensive and careful management, they managed to repopulate a couple of nearby islands. And today there are over 300 birds. So that's a really lucky to have um, black robins still. And this nearest tomtit in the bottom right is quite similar looking, but closely related to the tomtit we get on the mainland, which is the bottom left. And they're also very friendly birds. There's not much else to say about them apart from that. Um, we've got some pigeons and doves. Um, a few you might recognize, feral pigeons, of course, and two, uh, well, three introduced species, the feral pigeon and the two doves. And the two endemic species, Kiriru, New Zealand pigeon, which is quite a large, um, bigger than the common wood pigeons, that most people know. Um, they grow up to about 50 centimeters. And yeah, they're really lovely. And then on the Chatham Islands, they have a larger representative, which is um, what spends most of its time on the ground. And just have to mention quickly some of our urban species because this is what most people see when they come to New Zealand if they're not looking too hard. Um, so the chaffinch, uh, if you don't know what the one in the middle is, you probably shouldn't be here. <laughs> it's the house sparrow, of course. Uh, goldfinch, greenfinch, all introduced from Europe. Um, Dunnock, blackbird, starling, and the miner from India. And eastern rosella, which is the parrot on the left, uh, which is from Australia. And these are some of the other introduced species that we get in rural areas. Um, just to give an idea that Europeans didn't just bring mammals here, they bought all sorts um, for reasons sort of beyond understanding. Uh, the blackbird and the song thrush, which isn't here, um, were actually bought for apparently nostalgic reasons or something like that by the Acclimatization Society. When people began to settle in New Zealand, they bought their birds with them that they knew, so they would feel more at home. <laughs> Doesn't make much sense to me. But yeah, we have so many good birds anyway. Like they bought mallards to hunt and brown quail and California quail to hunt. Um, we had our own ducks and our own quail, 
and bringing their ones from overseas didn't really stop them from hunting out quail to extinction. Um, but luckily our ducks sort of survived the worst of it. And we've got two kingfishers. Kookaburra is not really a kingfisher and it's not really a New Zealand bird. For those people who don't know them, they're very much Australian, very iconic bird of Australia. And we have them in a very small area just north of Auckland. Um, they were also introduced. And they haven't really spread out much because we don't have any snakes either. And that was their primary source of prey um, over in Australia. So they're sort of just li living on smaller things like skinks and insects. Uh, but the sacred kingfisher is found all across New Zealand. They're very common. So we have lots of shorebirds, um, which of course are very cool and diverse. I tried to sort of show a bit of scale here. I was sizing the images. So our smallest one is the red neck stink, stint in the bottom left, and then the largest, the Eurasian curlew in the top right. Um, and the most common is the bar-tailed godwit in the center. So we get approximately 80,000 of those coming over here every summer. Um, huge flocks of them, which is quite spectacular, um, along with lesser knots and ruddy turnstone, which both show up in really good numbers. And then everything else is sort of quite low, low numbers and seems to be less and less each year, which is quite unfortunate. So we probably get 50 to 100 red neck stints, um, a couple dozen sandpipers, maybe five sandaling. Um, so they're quite rare. Obviously the most, one of the most common shorebirds overseas, so most people won't come to New Zealand to look for a sandaling, but I found one about a month and a half ago, so I was quite happy with that. And yeah, the Eurasian curlew, we only get two or three every year now. Um, a couple of decades ago, it might've been 10 or 20. Um, and I'm sure it was much more before that as well, but they're critically endangered now. So they're one of the birds most threatened by um, development and pollution. Around China and Korea. Um, so that's a stopover area on their way to and from the breeding grounds. Um, yeah, so they would breed, most of these birds will breed up in the Arctic Circle and migrate to New Zealand during the austral summer, so October to March. Yeah. And that is pretty remarkable. So the Bartow Godwit actually completes the longest nonstop flight of any bird and its migration round trip um, in one year will be about 30,000 kilometers for the birds coming and going from New Zealand. Sorry, 30,000 kilometers, yeah. Um, we've got plenty of birds that also stay um, around the shores all year round. Um, New Zealand doctoral, uh, the recently arrived black fronted doctoral from Australia has only bred here for about 50, 60 years and they've done quite well. Um, oyster catchers, of course, and oh, uh, black stilt in the bottom left is an iconic species. That's, I guess it's iconic because it's so endangered. That's how it seems to go around here. Um, there's only about a couple hundred of them left uh, that are completely black, but they're actually being hybridized with the pied stilts, which is in top top left. And a lot of them look like that in the middle. So the pied stilt's native as well, but I guess development and um, sort of artificial um, habitats has caused them to sort of go into the same areas more. Whereas initially they might have had much more different niches. Um, but since human arrival, we've noticed a lot of hybrids and it's really unfortunate for the black stilts, which are being bred in captivity to, to sort of help save them from that. And there's just a few more. So this is probably one of our most special birds, uh, the Rybill, uh, which is because it is the only bird in the world to have a bill that is 
bent to the side. Uh, you can see it there in the center photo. Um, curved to the right slightly. And they use that to sort of get under stones and rivers and find little insect larvae and things like that to feed on. And then one of my favorites is the shore plover there at the bottom, um, which uh, also used to be found all around New Zealand and now there's only a small population on the Chatham Islands. Uh, with only a few hundred birds, um, but they're also being bred up um, to sort of help them there. And I talked a bit about the South Island snipe before, which went extinct in 1970. And luckily we still have a couple of representatives of that family, the Chatham Island snipe, the Subantarctic snipe, and the Sneers Island snipe, which I haven't seen, um, which uh, survived on pest-free islands. We have a, quite a few wetland birds as well. Um, two species of crake, which if you haven't seen a crake before, they're not much bigger than a sparrow and very, very secretive, sort of hiding amongst the vegetation uh, and don't often come out. And the banded rail, which is a bit bigger than that, a little bit more confiding, but not, not too much. And the fern bird, which is also about sparrow sized with a very really long sort of scraggly tail. We also have the Pukiko in the bottom left. Um, coots, same one as in Eurasia, different subspecies. Uh, likewise with the crested grebe, which when I was in Belgium, I would see just sort of on any bit of water that what there was even just canals around Bruges and things like that. Whereas in New Zealand, they're only sort of found in high um, mountain, high country mountain lakes, which is quite interesting. And uh, one of my favorite pictures of the New Zealand dab chick with the chicks on the back. And then it's just an example of some, some of our waterfowl. And it's pretty diverse. So all of these are native, apart from the mallard, of course. And the black swan was introduced to New Zealand, but apparently around the same time, it self-introduced um, from Australia. So it's hard to say if it's really native or introduced or both. Similar to the black stilt is the grey duck in the bottom right there. Oh. Um, they are suffering from hybridization with mallards. Uh, you can see the hybrid in the center to see, yeah, most of our ducks actually look like the hybrids now. Uh, a recent study suspected that approximately 8% um, of grey ducks in New Zealand might be pure, it could be a lot less, and about 22% of mallards. So here is uh, another one of our quite special birds, uh, Australasian bittern, which is critically endangered, um, there's probably less than a thousand, probably a lot less in New Zealand and a similar number in Australia. And of course, extremely cryptic like any bittern, blending in with their surroundings. And if they think they've been spotted, they'll shoot off or stand very still like a stick and maybe even sway in the wind if it's windy for added effect. And then there's a view of our heron species as well. So the Nanki night heron uh, in the bottom left there. It's a funny angle, it looks a bit like an owl, which I guess makes sense since they're nocturnal. Um, was my 200th bird in New Zealand and they only breed along one, one river. Um, they came over from Australia in the 50s and haven't really spread out, but they've held on, which is nice. New Zealand has quite an interesting diversity when it comes to shags. Um, most of you might know them as cormorants, uh, same thing. Um, the black shag on the right is the same species as the great cormorant, which is found across much of the world. Um, we also have the, these three, um, little black, pied and little. Really creative names and that really don't help at all when you're trying to identify them because sometimes the uh, black shag has white bits and sometimes the little shags are completely black, so it's not helpful. And we also got four black-footed shags and we've also got two yellow-footed shags um, 
which are a bit more um, unique to New Zealand. Spotted and Pitt Island Shag. Lovely crests and facial colours during the breeding season. And then we also have seven species of pink-footed uh, marine shags, which um, seem to just have split off into many different populations and then um, evolved into different species from there. So, right, so all together we've got 14 species of, is it 14, 7, 9, 13 species of shag that breed here. And just to show you a bit um, of where these birds are, going back to this map, the king shag, which you can still see, is the yellow circle up in the Marlborough Sound in New Zealand, um, on sort of between the North and South Islands. And then each of these other circles represents a different species of pink-eyed shag, sorry, pink-footed shag. Um, yeah, which is really crazy. You have to go to all these islands if you want to see all the different types of shag. Most of them have their own um, endemic uh, land birds. And, but really what they're special for is the seabirds, um, which we'll get to soon. We've got um, three large gannet colonies on the mainland, which are really popular tourist spots because they're quite entertaining to observe. Um, I could spend hours watching them. I've got one um, 45 minutes from my house up in Auckland and my auntie lives right next to it. So I've been to this one, which is called Midawai Beach, uh, quite a few times in my life. And every now and then something unusual pops up. So we get uh, brown boobies almost every summer, um, one or two of those. And a few years back, a red-footed booby popped up, which was the first um, record in New Zealand. So that was quite exciting. Um, we're not as big as an event as it would be in another country like England or South Africa, uh, but we did have maybe 50 people go out and see it, um, and probably other members of the public that saw it in the news and wanted to go have a look as well. But yeah, big twitches like that don't get more than maybe 50 people. Um, or as I know in other countries, you might get several hundred there at a time with a whole row of scopes. So here's a few of our seabirds. Uh, the great albatrosses are, of course, the most spectacular. Absolutely huge birds. Um, we've got three species that breed of great albatrosses, uh, northern southern royal, southern being the largest, uh, New Zealand wandering albatross, and we also have the snowy wandering which migrates through and breeds on Macquarie Island which is owned by Australia, just a bit further south of the southern Antarctic. And to give you an idea of just how huge these birds are, here is a human for scale. So that's the Southern Royal, and their wingspan is up to 3.5 metres long, and that is about 11 and a half feet. They're pretty docile too, which is nice, not very aggressive. And then the mollywalks, which are these smaller, um, lesser albatrosses, 10 species that visit New Zealand. Um, most of them breed here. Most of them are endemic to New Zealand as well. So we've got the Campbell Island Molly Mock on the left, um, which has a spectacular honey colored iris, which you can sort of just see there. And Chatham Island Molly Mock, Southern Bullers, and Salvins are just a few examples. My favorite seabird would have to be the light mantled sooty albatross. They're just stunning got a little blue line on the mandible and a pale ring around the eye and they just look so smooth and they're really sort of effortlessly elegant and flying and they've got, yeah they fly around in, in pairs uh, and do little displays sort of around the cliffs um, really amazing and then going into the petrels quite a lot of species most of them breed here um, New Zealand is the seabird capital of the world, um, so we've just got a huge chunk of um, the world's seabirds breed in New Zealand um, and a lot of other ones visit as well every now and then. Um, the hunchback northern giant petrel and the southern giant, I to tell, tell those apart, you've got to look at the bills. So the northern giant's got a darker reddish tip and the southern giant's got the green tip. 
and they breed uh, at Macquarie Island. So not in New Zealand, but the Northern Giants breed uh, on most of the New Zealand subantarctic islands, and they're fairly common around our, our coasts. Very aggressive as well. Um, I'll stick their heads into like carcasses of seals and sea lions and beach whales and things like that. And, yeah, you can find pictures of that on Google. I don't have any. Um, and then just showing a bit of the diversity that we get in terms of petrels. Um, so all the cookal areas along the bottom there, named after the cook's petrel in the bottom right. All fairly similar, but they've got subtle sort of distinguishing features between them. Maybe the amount of black on the underwing, um, mottled petrel, which is nice and easy with its grey belly. And then the storm petrels, which are the smallest um, seabirds. Uh, the grey-backed in the centre is the smallest of the small. It's like <laughs> just a bit bigger than a sparrow as well. And they sort of dance on the water. So the white-faced storm petrels actually have the nickname Jesus birds for the way they just sort of tap dance, walking along the water. Uh, one of our more special ones is the New Zealand storm petrel. Um, they were only known from a few sort of museum specimens. And in 2003, uh, one flew into a man's boat and was sort of caught and it was found to be the species, which they only knew from the museum specimens. And since then, it's become fairly easy to see, actually. Um, we do pelagics out of the north, uh, northern coast of New Zealand quite regularly and see them on almost every trip. At one point, we had up to 40 actually dancing off the boat, which is quite, quite amazing. So the reason why they went so long um, undetected would have been because of the island that they breed on, um, Little Barrier, actually wasn't pest free, but it had um, cats up until the 1990s, uh, which were then eradicated. So you can sort of see the timeline there that allowed when the cats were eradicated, these birds had much better breeding success. And then sort of a decade after that, it was visible in numbers out at sea. And they just had a real amazing comeback. We also have all these shearwaters, uh, a lot of very similar looking birds too. Um, they sort of know what you're doing when it comes to seabirds if you want to tell them apart. Um, I'm sure for the people in South Africa, they'll be familiar with some of these species and the petrels as well. We get some similar ones. Um, yeah, all of these species breed in New Zealand, apart from the short-tailed shearwater, uh, which migrates through. Um, the wedge-tailed is tropical, and then other ones uh, like the sooty are found more around the subantarctic, but huge, huge numbers. So uh, when I went down to the Snares Island, which is one of their biggest colonies, this is what it looked like at dawn when all the birds were leaving. We must have seen at least 500,000. It's just real impossible to try and estimate how many there were. So all those black specks are a bird. And then one, one group that I particularly like are the prions uh, because they're so difficult. Uh, you, there's seven species of prion. Um, these are some of the ones found in New Zealand. So the fairy, broad build, and Antarctica, the ones that breed here. And we also get thin build um, salvins and fulmar prions. And one thing that is peculiar about prions is they often wash up in quite large numbers in the winter. So I think in 2011, we had 200,000 broad build prions wash up on the beach, um, which it's not always clear why this happens, but it can often be um, correlated with weather conditions or maybe um, more increasingly things like plastic ingestion and things like that. So the broadbill prion, you can see why it has its name. It's got half a boat sunk to its face. Um, but generally the prions are quite, quite difficult to, to separate if you don't get a good look at them. Um, if you put all of the species that I mentioned sort of in a line, it's a bit, it's a real gradient, and you can only really look at the size and shape of the bill. Um, so fairy and thin build have the smallest bill, and then it's Antarctic's more intermediate, and then broad bill's got the biggest. 
and then Blue Petrol is getting honourable mention uh, for being in its own family and being a very rare sort of migrant that po probably comes to New Zealand waters every year. Um, but this one that I photographed was the second record of one of the mainland, which is cool. And we get five species of skewer. Um, the most common is the Arctic skewer or parasitic Jaeger, uh, which migrates to New Zealand and then breed up in the Arctic Circle, uh, much like the shorebirds. And we also get the Pomerine and the long tailed, but they're much, much, much less common and very difficult to tell apart. Um, but the subantarctic brown skewer is resident on all the subantarctic islands, uh, really sort of frightening birds. They're bigger than most skulls and uh, quite aggressive, especially if you get near the nests. So we found one when I was down there um, a couple of weeks ago that was enjoying its dinner. So that is a common diving petrel halfway down its throat, which was unfortunate for him, but it, it looked very dead at least. Um, and we were watching it trying to swallow this bird. Uh, and in the end, it just gave up and spat it out and then took it somewhere more private um, to possibly try again. But with colonies of these, um, you see sort of, we call them middens, which is just like piles of remains of little seabirds. They swallow and then spit out like pellet form um, with the indigestible um, feathers and bones and things like that. It's really quite grim. So we've only got uh, three species of resident gull uh, in New Zealand, which makes things quite easy um, because there's not much to confuse them with. But in saying that, um, the red build and the black build gull, you can't rely on the colour of that build to tell them apart. So we've got those two to try separate. Um, if you look at the shape of the bill, actually, it's the best way to do it. So let's go here. Um, the black billed gull has a much sort of more slender bill um, and then more stubby on the red billed. And we also get uh, three vagrant species every now and then um, Franklin's and Laughing Gull from North America, and Pacific Gull has shown up once from Australia. Um, the terns are one of my favourites as well. We've got a really cool diversity. Um, 19 species. They don't all breed here. Uh, a few of them are vagrants, but it's kind of hard to classify with terns because sometimes we don't even know if they're still in the country or not. So we had an invasion of um, gullbills, Australian gullbill terns, which is the top centre a few years ago, and they've been sticking around. And just last week, actually, we detected the first breeding record. So that's um, one of our newest native species, which is really cool. The other ones like the little terns in the bottom right actually migrate um, and come here in the summer. Uh, other ones are resident in breeze here, so Caspian white fronted terns, black fronted syndemic, um, Antarctic, we have around the subantarctic islands. Um, the sooty terns are subtropical, and then as well as the grey noldies, which are in the bottom right. And the New Zealand fairy tern in the top right is actually regarded often as our rarest bird currently. Uh, there's only about 40 individuals and they're threatened by just about everything you can imagine. Um, all the mammals that I mentioned earlier and because they nest in sand dunes, they're really sort of susceptible to holiday makers and um, people driving on beaches or going into the dunes and just, yeah, it's, they, they have a pretty difficult um, and they're really small as well. So the Caspian tern, which is one of the largest terns, it's about 45 centimetres, 40 centimetres long. Um, and then the fairy tern is about um, thrush sized. So it's a real dramatic difference there. And then we've got to give a bit of time to the penguins because who doesn't love penguins? They're really special and we're lucky to have so many of them around New Zealand. Um, we've got six species that breed on the mainland and the subantarctic, uh, three on the mainland itself. Um, and a few more species that show up when they're molting. So 
there was a real um, fuss in 2011 when a, a molting king, king penguin, um, no, it wasn't even molting, it was a juvenile king penguin showed up on the beach um, about an hour's drive from New Zealand's capital city. That was probably the biggest twitch um, that, that we've had. I was 11 at the time, so didn't go for it. But the little penguin is the smallest penguin in the world. It's only 30 centimeters, so about that big. Um, and they are all around the coast of New Zealand. We also have a few crested penguins. Um, this near crested uh, is pretty chunky bill there and the erect crested on the right. The bird on the right is the erect crested and then the one on the left uh, sort of looking at it is actually also a snares crested. If you look closely, you can sort of see the difference in the crests, um, but apart from that, they're very difficult to tell. And the rock hopper in the top left, which I saw for the first time um, a couple of weeks ago, that was the best photo we could manage. So we, we weren't able to get up into the colony because uh, of the weather. Um, this is down at the Auckland Islands and the conditions were initially quite good going down but on, on the way back, which is about a day and a half at sea on the vessel um, was 10 meters swell. So it was a bit uh, nauseous for some people. And then our most iconic penguin, I suppose, um, living in Dunedin now is pretty close to my heart because this is uh, quite where I'm only about 30 minutes from a colony of these, uh, which are very, very threatened. There's only a few pairs um, left in that area. Uh, there might be 500 pairs total in the world, so not doing so well. They're really susceptible to disturbance and overfishing and things like that. So yeah, people are doing what they can to sort of improve their breeding success. But yeah, so that's a lovely photo of one serenading us. Yeah, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, but as most of the birds that you can find around New Zealand in a short amount of time, I hope you enjoyed the photographs. And if you want to look more at my book, you can check it out on my website and more of my photos on Facebook and Instagram. And thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. And I think we'll do some questions now. Thanks so much, uh, Oscar. That was a really, really exciting and interesting overview. And I think there are a few questions in the chat. Um, there's 70 people still in the room. So I would appreciate if people could just put their questions in the chat. Uh, there's just too many people to open to do open mic. Um, so if you don't mind, put your questions in the chat. I'm going to just scroll back up and I will pick up uh, the questions. Um, I think the first one is from uh, uh, Shalish uh, Patel saying, I have two questions. Have you ever been to Africa for birding? And uh, where, what countries have you birded in Europe? I'd love to get to Africa one day. It's high up on my list. I mean, there's, there's so many birds out there that you can like just dream about. Um, like the secretary bird and pithecartes and um, yeah, I, I would very much like to get out there one day. Um, well, you're Europe, welcome. So I, I, <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> anytime. Um, I spent a year in Belgium and in that time I was able to go to most of the surrounding countries. Um, we had a couple of weeks in Italy, uh, France, uh, England, uh, of course, Germany and the Netherlands were the closest ones. And I had a short excursion over to Denmark um, as well. And a few hours in Sweden. So I think that was uh, the, the main countries that I went to in Europe that I can remember. Um, and each one of them, I, I found something new, which was nice, um, despite them being so close together. But yeah, really enjoyed it. Cool. And then, um, so, so Jackie's asking, uh, so many of the birds are ringed. There must be a lot of research going on in New Zealand. Yes, yeah. You'll, you'll have seen them in most most of the photos, but I'll just go to one for an example. 
That was a good example. The robins were pretty good. So you can see the South Island robin and the black robin there um, have the rings. Uh, yes, this is quite common, especially with the more endangered species or um, translocated birds to sort of keep track of populations. Um, for some in particular, like the, the kulkaka, which have known territories, uh, they will do it for genetics. So when they have rings like this in the unique combination, so they read them from top to bottom on the left leg and top to bottom on the right leg, you can actually recall the individual bird and uh, identify it and its partner. And if you're really sort of monitoring them, um, it'll be really helpful for genetics to know who their parentage is and make sure you're not sort of having pairs of really closely related birds, um, you know, mating and <coughs> having offspring, uh, which does happen, unfortunately, especially on small islands. Um, but yeah, it's a good way to keep track of things like that. And then I think a, a related question from David says, how active are conservation groups and the government in protecting all these endangered birds? Um, increasingly so. Um, every year the, you, you hear more amazing stories of things like that. So uh, one that, that's come out of Wellington recently, which is the capital city, is that an entire peninsula, uh, which is quite densely populated, which will have maybe 100,000 people, has been made pest uh, free basically based because people have been trapping in their backyards. They've sort of had these community groups um, manage um, handing out traps and volunteering and things like that. And so they've gotten rid of everything, including rats, which is really impressive. Um, and that's becoming more common across, across the country. Um, the government's been doing very well recently. Um, the Green Party gets more votes every year, which is the, the environmentally focused one, and they get more seats in the parliament and then uh, have more of a voice, which is really, really important. And um, yeah, most recently we had our last election last year, and what came out of that was 11,000 uh, jobs created specifically for nature and conservation. Um, so it's a really, really big and growing sector here, which is really important. Another question from Shalish. He says, paradise shell duck, do they lay their eggs in other duck species' nests? Um, we have no, no ducks that do that, actually. No sort of parasitic ones. Um, that's an interesting one to single out. Uh, the male, I forgot to mention that the male and the female are sexually dimorphic quite dramatically. Um, you can see the male there on the bottom left is completely black and then the female is brown with the white head. Um, but no, they, they make their own nests. Um, all of our ducks do, yeah. It's just the cuckoos that parasite other birds that we have. Um, Kathy asks, which has the smallest bill? I'm not sure in relation to which this was. It might be the terns, but I'm not sure. Kathy, can you clarify? Well, um, going back to the very start, the kiwi has the smallest bill by definition because the bill is measured um, from the nostril to the tip and the kiwi's nostrils being at the very end of the bill means that their bill is only a few millimeters long. Um, but if you're looking for a, a properly small bill then the rifleman in the top left there would be the culprit. So they're only eight centimeters long, um, which is our smallest bird in New Zealand uh, and weigh um, 10 grams, I believe. There's a, a lot, a huge number of uh, positive comments and people saying, sending their appreciation. I'm not going to read all of those. Uh, uh, Samuel is asking, what is the best season to visit New Zealand? In, good, in a good bird watching morning, how many species will you see? Um, every season has something to offer. I would say the most diverse time, if you're into your shorebirds, uh, would be the summer um, because that's the best time to see all the migrant species and in a, in, a, in a morning at a good spot you might see 30 40 species that would be the general sort of expectation um, i've seen 50 at a spot in a day sometimes if it's really good uh, but yeah generally not much more than that we had a few big day competitions and the best i've got was 84 
it's a lot of driving and some lunatics that went overnight for 24 hours uh, managed to scrape, I think, 106 species in a day. And then I think it's Harriet's asking how many species of kiwis are, are there? There are five um, species of kiwi. As you can see all of them here, if you look closely. Um, North Island brown, uh, Tokoeka, which is the southern brown, uh, the two spotted, so little spotted and great spotted, and the rowie, which is Ocarito brown kiwi, which is only found in a little wetland on the west coast of the South Island. Now, if you look at the map on the right. And then there's a non-bird related question from David. Does Bounty Island have any connection to the HMS Bounty? Off the top of my head, I think it does, but I would refer you to Google for that. I, I haven't been there myself, so I can't talk much about it. Cool, yeah. And that's the last question. And I think that's a good note. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Where, uh, sorry, someone's, uh, uh, Natalie is asking, uh, where's the best place to see seabirds? Everywhere. So the main sort of um, public pelagics that they do would be out of Kaikoura, which I don't know if you can see me point, but does that laser pointer show up? Yep. So there's Kaikoura there, which is on the east coast of the South Island. And that's the most sort of common place because that's where the deepest water is. Um, so that's, they, they run almost daily trips out of there, um, struggling a little bit with the lack of tourists in New Zealand, but uh, the public, uh, the locals have been really good at sort of doing that and keeping them going. Um, and there's also really good ones in the Horaki Gulf just out of Auckland. Um, but you can go off the coast anywhere if you have a boat or get on a boat like the ferry between um, Wellington and Picton here um, or Stewart Island, and you will see lots of seabirds. They, they are absolutely everywhere. Cool. Um, I think that's a good note to end on. And uh, it's been a really good, really interesting presentation. And uh, I, I mean, we had uh, 80 people here at uh, one point. So that's also a record uh, at least for this year. Um, and uh, so it's good that there was such good turnout. And it's also good that there were so many people from so many different countries. So we, we really appreciate your, your taking time to come visit Learn the Birds. Uh, hopefully you will spread the word among your, your birding friends. Um, there's a lot more happening, especially in the next month when we're celebrating women, as I said, in, in birding and ornithology. And um, also starting in April, we have uh, some tours to different parts of the world. Um, we've also had um, uh, um, Faraz Abdul from Trinidad and Tobago join the team. So there's only four of us in the, I can't count, four of us <laughs> in the Learn the Birds team. And two of the guys are uh, tour guides and they're out every day these days. So um, Faraz has joined us and he's going to be setting up some activities uh, better for uh, time zones in the Americas. And he's also going to start a talk show kind of arrangement uh, for some of the webinars as well. So there won't always be presentations, but there'll be talk shows and opportunities for people to ask questions um, at any time and, and that kind of thing. So we've got some exciting things coming up. Um, we've just completed the, uh, the technology for uh, enabling uh, um, online courses as well. So we'll soon be offering some of those. So check back often at Learn the Birds and we'll hopefully see some of you in the next one, um, which is, and I should have said that, uh, but before you go, let me quickly tell you what's up next week. Um, next week is uh, Magic Beaks uh, with Carla Dutoy. Carla's uh, uh, just done some amazing work on, among other things, the, the uh, I think it's a brown kiwi and uh, our hardy does in South Africa and comparing the beak structure with some of the extinct birds from the Mesozoic era. So there's some really interesting stuff that Carla is gonna talk about. So come back next week on the 3rd of March and, uh, and hear all about magic beaks. So that's it, thank you everybody. And thanks so much, Oscar. We really appreciate you waking up so early in the morning to uh, come and do this uh, webinar for us. And uh, by the way, Oscar's webinar will be up on the Learn the Birds uh, YouTube channel in a couple of days. So that's all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on where you are.
Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks, Oscar.